Yeah, we'll just wait for, um, as I mentioned, you're be a bit late, so you can start without her if you'd like. Good morning. I'd like to call the TNRD Policy Review Committee meeting for September 22nd, 2021 to order. Um, and I would like to acknowledge that we at the TNRD connect with many First Nation communities across our vast regional district. And today are located on the Tecumlips Te Sequetmec territory, situated within the unceded ancestral lands of the Sequetmec Nation. The TNRD appreciates the partnership that we have with Tecumlips Te Sequetmec and respect the territory and land on which we gather here today. Uh, I do have one announcement. Uh, we are joined today by Amanda Ellison, just to my left here. She is our new general manager of people and engagement, and uh, she will have some information to share later on in this meeting. Are there any additions to or deletions from the agenda today? Seeing none, we will move on to item four, uh, the July 15th Policy Review Committee meeting minutes from, uh, can I get someone to move? So moved. Second. Moved by Director Kershaw, seconded by Director Stamer. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried. Um, first item of business, 5.1. Policy 5.2.1, disposal of assets. And I believe Ms. Campbell will be sharing that with us. And I turn that over to Mr. Ray, actually. Mr. Ray. Sure, thank you, Chair. Um, this was just a, uh, a policy that I thought needed some housekeeping attention. Um, I've included the existing policy for everyone to see, and it's, it's pretty bare bones. It talks about book sales from the library and otherwise, it just kind of talks in general what the process would be if assets are valued at under a thousand or over a thousand. And it didn't specifically address things that were common practice, such as trading in older corporate vehicles towards the cost of a purchase of a new replacement vehicle. And I thought it was time to just um, include a little bit more detail. Um, and as I, as I looked at it, and I, and I looked at some of the other um, policies, uh, comparable policies with uh, neighboring regional districts. Um, I saw that some of that was already addressed in some of their policies. So I cleverly adopted some of their wording. And um, so what you see is um, a policy that not only kind of lays out the process uh, and who has the authority to dispose of assets, but a bit of a preferential listing of, of those methods, whether it be uh, using it in another TNRD service, uh, trading it in, um, uh, selling it through a public offering, but also um, specifically addressing the opportunities if, if they come along uh, for donations to uh, worthy not-for-profits, um, recycling and so on. So. Um, that's about all I have, if you have any questions. Thank you for your presentation. Um, any discussion or questions on this policy? Dr. Brown. Um, trade in value, are you talking about the book value or the actual fair market value at the time? 
generally we would go with um, what we have as a book value. So if we have an asset that's say six years old and has been depreciated over that six years and has very little book value left, we'd be looking at that. Um, but we might take uh, market value into account. Uh, certainly something like a vehicle, um, uh, you know, we, we would typically be guessing what the uh, salvage value or, or residual value of that asset would be at the end of the T and D's use of it. Um, but, uh, you know, we'd be looking at certainly maximizing what we get as a uh, trade in proceeds. Thank you. Director Quinn. Uh, there we go. <clears throat> what I don't see in here is um, anything about director's computers. Uh, it's by the time we finish with a four year term, they're pretty much uh, <clears throat> become obsolete. And I don't know what past practice has been since I left last time, but uh, directors were uh, given the option of buying out their computers for, I think, I think the amount of that time was a hundred bucks. And I don't see that in here. And if that if that's the desire of the, of the committee, uh, it should reflect that. So it's really clear to the public. Uh, and I say that because some directors, uh, I'm not one of them, use it for personal stuff too. Um, so is that, should that be included? And is that what the appetite of the committee would be? So to <laughs> if, I, if I can jump in there, that's actually addressed in a separate board policy. And that's why uh, section eight of this policy, I use the wording, unless specifically addressed in another policy, blah, blah, blah. So that would be an example of another policy where that's specifically addressed. Okay, fair enough. I, I understand that. Um, does that other policy also set a value? I believe it does. I haven't looked okay. at it lately. Then that answers my question. Thank you. Thank you, Director Steamer. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm um, just looking on the part where it talks about the ADR forms. And then down at the bottom on number five, it says the board must be informed of the intent to dispose of assets that have a historical cost in excess of 100,000 intent for disposal may be provided within the five year financial plan and does not require a board resolution. Why is that? Um, again, that was that was looking at what the practice in other regional districts was. We didn't have anything like that in the existing policy. Uh, and I thought it would be worthwhile adding it. Um, in terms of, of that process, I think if it's explicitly spelled out in the budget that the board adopts, what it's really getting at is saying, if, you, if you're adopting the budget and there's an explicit disposal in there, um, then that's a sufficient method of informing the board and getting a decision from the board without having to go to the steps of having a, another specific motion. Um, that was the intent. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. But I'm just, but but it says it may be provided. It doesn't necessarily have to be provided. Well, so that's if, with, it, with the wording. I'm just wondering if it's something that if we're going to be starting to talk of those kinds of dollars, maybe we should still have that mechanism where it does still get the attention of the board so that there is no yeah. mistakes being made in that those kinds of realms. I mean, anything less than that is still a significant amount of money, but $100,000 is $100,000. I think, um, so it says the board must be informed of the intent to dispose of assets with a historical cost in excess of $100,000. So that's a must. Intent for disposal may be provided. So it may be that after the board has adopted a budget, somewhere along the lines, the decision is made to uh, dispose of an asset. And at that point, it would come to the board as a separate um, separate motion because it wasn't included in the financial plan, but where possible, and it can be anticipated, we would attempt to include it in the financial plan. So it's, it's, it's basically a timing issue of saying, if we can put it in the financial plan, we will. But if that's not feasible because it's later in the year, then we'll bring it directly to the board's attention otherwise. Thank you. I have Director Bass and Director Quinn next. Um, I, I actually want to speak on a different matter. I'm sorry, I signaled you at the wrong time. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm going to focus down on something I know that's going on. Uh, Blue River has an old water filter that when the water system was put in. 
that was actually never used. Uh, we'll be doing some upgrades uh, to the water system, which will not require it. And I think, I'm not sure what the intent of the, uh, the uh, uh, utilities department is, but I, the suggestion to me was made, we'll hang on to it in case somebody needs it. So that's an asset that's probably depreciated like mad by now in a normal business sense. How would that, how would that be handled? Doug, please. Well, again, I, I don't know what the historic cost was. So if it was greater than $100,000, we'd be bringing it to the board. Um, and beyond that, if I look at the preferential methods, um, Blue River might not be able to use it, but maybe one of our other water yeah. systems might. That's so what, that I, that's what the, I was thinking. Uh, that so. would be the, the first. Um, and generally what we do from an accounting purposes would be to credit Blue River for a value and charge it to the other service that's purchasing it. Okay, so that, that makes sense. That's more or less what Jake and I were talking about. Yeah. On that. Uh, the other issue to that was there was grant money involved in doing that. So is that repairable? This was 20 years ago. I'm not sure I understand the question. We got a grant to help do that work. To, to purchase the to purchase the, the item. It was part of a whole system. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, for which we got grant. I don't think it was ever costed out as to which piece was which. Yeah. But does that does that cause liability on disposal of that asset to return that a portion of that grant? I um, don't I don't think so unless yeah. there's something specific in the grant wording that says, you know, yeah, that was once you dispose ago. of the asset 20 years from now, you'll owe us money back. But I, I doubt it. I'm just trying to yeah. anticipate. So we don't have a problem when it goes to go. Yeah. Thank you. Thank I wouldn't you. anticipate that yeah. being a problem. May I suggest that that conversation can continue outside of the, this meeting? Um, and, and that's great that we have a specific example of how yeah. this policy may come into, into play, but um, might be a different conversation. So perhaps the question would be, does this cover this? I think it does from my reading of it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have Director Roden with her hand up there virtually. Hello, uh, thank you. Yes, the uh, the train's finally cleared. Um, on page 14, um, item number seven, uh, if sort of a catch-all, if a more advantageous option to dispose of an asset in an alternative method is realized that has not been identified above, the CAO will have the authority to approve of an alternative disposal method. Will this apply to uh, assets of any value, whether it's under a thousand or over? A thousand because if it's under a thousand previously, it says that uh, department managers can make that call. Yeah, again, I think that was intended to be a bit of a you know, <laughs> going to anticipate every single circumstance, and so some allowance for the CAO to consider uh, options that would be beneficial to the team. Um, there would be probably at that point, if you're looking at an alternative uh, method of disposal, um, it would be the CAO um, approving of that uh, as opposed to the department head because, um, because it's an alternate uh, idea. Uh, and again, if it's $100,000 or more, then that's gonna be brought to the board uh, for your attention. Thank you. Any other questions, discussion on this policy draft? Uh, Director Steamer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, so back to that same question I had, Doug. So the only thing I'm, I'm a little concerned about is that even if that is part of the five-year financial plan and <clears throat> there is, um, you're saying that there, there, there may, it may be provided um, information to the board we could have a scenario where we could have a brand new board and something could be looked at from a previous five-year financial plan you could be getting rid of an asset without any approval of the new board correct well, i guess that goes um the same if we were to receive you know emotion from the board uh, approving uh, one plan of action and then an election occurs and there's a new board, the direction we received from the previous board would still stand. 
Uh, I'm just wondering if we should have a difference. Well, the re what I'm what I'm saying is I'm wondering if we should have have that mechanism in place so that when we approach that hundred thousand dollars, regardless of it whether it's being part of the plan or not, that there's still an, an opportunity for the board to make the motion or not. What I'm saying is there would that would be the mechanism to yeah. stop it. We we could do that. I'm just saying that it's just an opportunity. Yeah. It's not a big deal. It doesn't happen a lot, but it is yeah. a significant amount. It's a significant asset. It's not just trading in a vehicle or whatever it is. Yeah. Maybe that's something that we should change so that it does have to be brought to the board's attention and the board does have to vote on. What yeah. does everybody else uh, think? I mean, it's not a big deal. It's just that yeah. it's just another it's just another check. And again, there could be an opportunity where you have a brand new board, you've got a five-year financial plan that's still rolling. All of a sudden you could be getting rid of a of a historical asset that maybe there's some board members that maybe don't agree with that, or maybe they want something done differently. Well, as I say, um, even if we did get a motion from the board and then we had a new board come in, that wouldn't necessarily nullify the motion from the previous board. But I see your point. And certainly, if that's the will of the committee, then we can make that change. Well, I'd like I'd like to make a motion that we we change that in as much as that when we have a cost in excess of $100,000, that it has to be brought to the board to make it efficient. Is that a second from Director Schaefer? Oh. Seconded by Director Brown. Discussion, Director Schaefer, on this is discussion on that particular motion. Yeah. Um, is this $100,000 when it was bought or is it $100,000 worth now? Yeah. No, I bought, no, no. It actually says, the wording says a historical cost. So it would have been what it would originally cost uh it could be depreciated to a much lower value at the point of disposal any further discussion on the motion that's currently on the floor all in favor any opposed uh, directors bass and kershaw are opposed but the motion carries returning to the original discussion are there any further questions or discussion on this item. I move the recommendation. Second. Moved by Director Stamer, seconded by Director Schaefer. Any further discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? Motion is carried unanimously. Thank you. And next up we have uh, item 5.2, anti-racism and anti-racial discrimination update. And I'm going to pass it over to Ms. Campbell for now. Thank you, Chair Sinclair. Um, so as the committee may recall, this was a policy that was identified um, as a gap. It's a, a policy that the TNRD currently does not have, but um, a number of other regional districts do. And in fact, um, it's, uh, it's been a recent um, move um, from a number of regional districts to adopt uh, such a policy. Um, so I, the, uh, I guess the, um, the goal behind it is to, um, you know, reinforce the TNRD's commitment to conducting um, our day-to-day -day operations and governance in an anti-discriminatory and anti-racist manner. So what we've done is we've taken um, an example from uh, several of the other regional districts that recently adopted such a policy, and we've um, provided that template um, as an example on the agenda. Um, but we just want the committee to be aware that and a reminder that we also have our respectful workplace uh, policy. And so we just want to ensure that this um, anti racism, anti racial discrimination policy, um, there's certainly going to be some overlap and that's okay, but the idea is they should sort of complement each other and, um, and there shouldn't be duplication. And I'm also just going to turn it over to our general manager of people and engagement because she can speak to um, some other actions um, that we may want to take as an organization, as a committee, as a board. Um, to work our way up towards being able to um, actually follow and enforce this policy. Thank you. So I think um, one of the pieces when I was looking at the policy is always to really align the policy with what our current practices and procedures are internally with the operations of the TNRD. And when I think about anti-racism and anti-racial discrimination, I think we have a few opportunities to improve our practices. We don't have a lot of set training and resources for employees. We don't have a lot of um, 
relations or efforts on, on part of our staff employment equity with Indigenous and peoples of color. So we're, we are missing some other kind of pieces that would help support an anti-racism and anti-racial discrimination policy be upheld. So when I look at it from that perspective, I sense a little bit of a risk in terms of us putting into place a policy that doesn't have all the practices and programs and procedures in place operationally to support. Um, so I'm just kind of mindful of that piece and thinking about further what steps we can put in place to support that policy development so that we have the practices on site with our staff and our teams to support it. I am newer to the TNRD, so I've just started in the last couple of weeks, so there may be um, other information that I'm missing and different perspectives that I'm happy to hear and, and encourage to build this policy further. Thank you, General Manager Ellison. And um, I noticed there's no recommendation on this item. So I'm, I'm guessing that's because um, we still have some work to do and some further research. And as you have mentioned, you've just started in this position. Perhaps there is some um, further reporting that you wish to do before the board adopts such a policy. Um, was there any further discussion on this item? Director Rothenberger. Uh, <clears throat> question and a comment. Um, I, somewhere in there, there's reference to, I don't know if it's mandatory training for staff and board members or just a hint at maybe training should be available from time to time. What, what's the intention there? Can you clarify that? In the policy, it does refer to training being available. So that is the draft policy. So we would have to do some more research and understanding about the resources that would be required and the recommended training that could be made available to staff. Thanks, Maya. Uh, and, and just comment about, about language. I know this is draft and it's lifted from or, or uh, borrowed from what's in place elsewhere, but our, uh, our approach on policy matters is that we and all communications in fact is that we use plain language um, i don't think this quite fits the bill in some respects i'll just give you one example under the appendix that refers to cultural racism the full adoption by an individual or group of the culture values and patterns of a different social religious linguistic or national ethos resulting in the diminution or elimination of attitudinal and behavioral characteristics of the original individual or group. I think that's, that's a bit much to wrap your head around. I don't even know if it pronounced all those words right. Um, maybe others would have the same problem, but uh, it, it is a caution that when we're formulating the final draft, that that very much be taken into consideration in every sentence that's written, that it's very clear, understandable and plain. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any further discussion on this item? Any questions of uh, General Manager Ellison? I believe Director Roden has a comment, maybe? Her hand's up. Sorry, Director Roden, I couldn't see your uh, yellow hand against the yellow background there. That's okay. Um, a couple of <clears throat> questions on page 20. It's under the roles and responsibilities, um, number seven. Train all new employees, volunteers, students, and contractors on this policy at the commencement of their employment. When I think of contractors, I think of people coming in to lay a driveway or do some electrical work. I'm not sure that that's the definition of contractor meant here. I think that a definition of what exactly is meant by a contractor is needed. Thanks, Director Roden, I can speak to that. So um, as noted, we, we, uh, we took this from other regional districts um, templates. And so some of them have decided to um, have this policy apply to like contractors as well that do work um, for their regional district. So I think that's another conversation that we likely have to have and um, the committee can perhaps provide some feedback to Amanda on this as to whether or how all encompassing we want this, um, this to be. Uh, for example, in some regional districts, it also includes um, their respective uh, union organizations. Um, so I, I think it's uh, it's really at the um, you know the the direction of the committee in terms of um, who we want this um, this policy to apply to within the TNRD. Director 
Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, that that would be a good discussion to have because I, I I'm I'm trying to picture a scenario where you're asking a construction company and its employees to sit down and and get trained on on anti-racial discrimination, and I'm not picturing it going terribly well. Um, going down further on that same page, 20 under the bullet point that starts subject to procedures referred to in respectful workplace policy. Da da da. It finishes. Um, Appropriate action to be taken, which may include education, training, or disciplinary action dependent upon the results. Um, results of what, I'm not wondering if results is the right word there, is the appropriate action to be taken dependent on the situation, dependent on the recommendations arising from that situation. I just think that needs a little bit of clarification. Thank you. I have, uh, thank you. I have Director Stamer and then Director Quinn. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yes, I agree. I mean, there's, I agree with uh, Director Rothenberger in as much as that we'd want to be able to make it as straightforward as we possibly can. And as we go through this, I would think that this would be something that we would include as a review, then training on our contractors and that sort of thing. So I'm sure there's an opportunity where we can have that discussion where, you know, when you're doing pre works and things like that, that there would be a, you know, a way of being able to make sure that uh, the majority of the, the basis of this policy would be able to be explained on the work site and then, you know, signed off on that. There'd be copies and that sort of thing. And I agree with Director Roden in as much as that uh, we can really get bogged down with a bunch of this stuff, but as long as we can simplify it, particularly for, for the people that are working for us to make sure that they know that we do have that policy in place. We have the mechanisms in place. If there are issues that arise from it and there's always the information that they can fall back upon in the policy. Thank you, Director Quinn. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Madam Chair. I, I, I'm a little confused. Director Roden was referring to page 20 and I've only got page five of six and six of six. So what page was she referring to? Maybe. Director Roden, you're on mute. The host would like me to unmute. Okay. Uh, no, I printed out the entire um, the entire agenda and policies and everything because I needed some homework last night. Um, and so this is page 20 of 33 for the entire bundle for this meeting. Uh, thank you. So I'm okay with five and six and six and six. Thank you. So I thought I was missing something. I'm, uh, I'm, do, I'm doing it in Imperial, uh, Director Quinn. You're probably doing it in metric. Five is five is five is five, whatever system we use. Um, are we adopting, are we adopting this for recommendation to the board? Or are we gonna have some future discussion? It, uh, yeah, thank you, Director Quinn. Yeah. It, it's, um, this is for discussion right now. We're not ready to make a recommendation to the board. And I think it's been um, clearly pointed yeah. out by our general manager of people and engagement that we have some work to do to ensure that this policy is not just a policy that sits on a shelf, but that we actually have some support for it and can follow through on it. Uh, thank you. The, the, the reason I asked that is that next year there will be a new board and I, su I suppose there will be some new members. And I would think that staff will certainly, it's changed so much since I first got elected that there needs to be maybe even a two day education process for um, new directors that are coming in particularly. Uh, the staff will do their staff thing, which is fine, which is great. Um, the other thing is when we go to get our papers to sign in for director, should, to, to run for director, should that kind of a, this kind of a policy be included in that to make sure that people know what they're getting into. Uh, it's just a thought. Thank you. It's an uh, interesting point to consider. Thank you, Director Quinn. Um, was there any response to that or? Certainly we can we can um, take that into consideration when we, you're talking about when we do the board orientation, Director Quinn. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think that's um, a great idea. I think there's a number of board policies yeah. in addition to to ones like this that would uh, and should be included, including the alternate director's policy that will be going to the board uh, tomorrow that this committee recommended. Yeah. You know, also, what I'm getting at is there is is this is important, um, and I've noticed over the years, particularly the person that ran against me last time, had hadn't a clue as to what he was getting into, and. It may be a little off topic, but there should be a package when you come in and pick the papers up, get a little package. Please read this before you sign the paper. Thank you. Thank you, Director Ken. Uh, we have Director Brown next. It wasn't relating to this issue, um, but I just had roles and responsibilities, number six, on page 19, um, just for Director Quinn. Uh, it's talking about our respectful work, workplace policy 7.1.2 and talking about one of the roles of the board members reporting incidents, uh, but it doesn't say who do they report it to. And I'm assuming it says that in respectful workplace policy, but um, it may be worthwhile putting it in here as well. Valid point. Thank you, Director Brown. Um, I see Director Roden either still has her hand up or perhaps it's a new hand. New hand, Director Roden. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, just uh, in regards to what Director Quinn was saying about uh, when this would be implemented and having it as something for new uh, board members, uh, a previous committee with the TNRD that I was on did discuss this and I think it was also part of a larger discussion we had about a year and a half ago about doing this sort of training when there is a new board that that is an ideal time to to uh, have videos in place training videos or arrange a workshop a half day whatever it happens to be and and have that every four years at least for board members so that that's a way that uh, no one can say that they were unaware of these policies. I see some heads nodding over here in the room. So um, I think your, your point has been taken there. Any further discussion on this item? I don't see any. I just wanted to, um, to thank staff for researching and looking into this. Um, I think it's, um, you know, the time has come for the TNRD to um, become a progressive workplace and progressive employer and um, ensure that all people feel welcome, um, whether they're elected officials or staff or whatever their role may be. So thank you so much for uh, putting this together. And with that, we are at item six, new business. Is there any new business? Um, I see a hand go up, Director Bass. Okay, I'm a little confused here. Um, are we going to deal with the respectful workplace separately or was it going to be part of the anti-racism discussion? Director Bass, I can speak to that. I just provided that, we just provided that on the agenda um, just because the anti-racism and anti-racial discrimination policy makes reference to it. Um, so it was just more for context that policy is already in place. Um, I believe it was uh, amended um, and updated not that long ago. Um, so it was really just there for reference. Yeah, I see that was uh, amended in March 12, uh, 2020. I do have a question about it though, and that's what I was confused with earlier. Um, and it's something, it comes from something that city council has recently done, which is adopted gender neutral language um, as being um, part of a respectful workplace. And I'm just wondering if this is something we should be looking at now too, because I know, for example, we're referring to uh, the chair as madam, uh, things like that. And it, it is difficult. I struggle with it at council, but um, there are people who are not identifying through the no genders that we ex normally accept. Thank you, Director Bass. I've actually been called Mr. Chair twice today, so um, I. <laughs> um, but um, you you raise a good point, and um, it, it was something that occurred to me as well um, when we talk about anti-racism. Um, you know, we don't really reference the LGBTQ S plus um, community either, and um, perhaps that's something that our director of people and engagement or manager of people engagement can be uh, addressing in her upcoming work as well. Absolutely. Thank you. I think we can look at that. And I, I pose maybe a question too late to the group, but with the respectful workplace environment, it does cover 
all forms of harassment and discrimination, which would include racial discrimination. So I am potentially quite late into the game, but has there been a conversation around the pros and cons of actually articulating a full and complete second policy versus re-amending that workful, respectful workplace to clarify and emphasize anti-racial and anti-racist discrimination? Thank you. Dr. Brown. I was wondering that same thing myself. Why do we have two? Um, I would like to see them combined. Director Roden. Uh, thank you. Just regarding the, um, the the gender neutral language, I think when it comes to things like addressing the chair, uh, I, since we do not have an alternative, a gender neutral alternative from Madam Chair or, or Mr. Chair, I think that persons in that situation could say in advance what their preference was. The way you see, I noticed the UBCM, for example, a lot of people on their profiles had, uh, you know, their name, you know, Joe Smith, and then in brackets, he, him. So I think it would be an individual choice whether you were called Madam Chair or Mr. Chair or some other alternative. And because there is not a happy one that leaps instantly to mind, that would be then up to people to decide what they wanted to be referred to as. That would be, so I, I see that as being very much an individual choice. Fair point for consideration. Thank you, Director Roden. Um, going back to combining the anti-racism policy and the respectful workplace policy, um, personally, I'd be in favor of um, looking at other regional districts and other um, leading employers and institutions and, and seeing what their practices are, um, as long as we don't lose the spirit of, of um, what's being expressed in the anti-racism policy, for example. Um, I, you know, it doesn't personally matter to me whether it's one policy or two. Director Quinn. Um, respectfully to Director Roden, I think com combination of the two should come a long way down the road. Um, the society as a whole is, is only just beginning to really recognize the serious problems with all sorts of discrimination. And at this moment in time, um, particularly with, um, with the truth and reconciliation thing, we really need to make a clear statement on racial, uh, um, uh, on racial issues. And that's what I see in this policy, rather than combining it, just in case it doesn't water down the whole thing. Uh, I, that's just my opinion, so thank you. Thanks, Director Quinn. Any further discussion? I think we've got quite a bit to uh, work with here. And when I say we, I mean um, our, our general manager over here. Um, I don't see any further discussion. So, um, oh, I'm sorry, Director Roden. Okay, I'm sitting way off here in Ashcroft. I'm not surprised you can't see me. Uh, no, uh, to, to Director Quinn, I wasn't suggesting that the two be combined necessarily. In fact, my preference would be to keep them separate just because um, putting them together, one might subsume the other or dilute one of them or both of them. I don't know. I, I would be happier. My personal preference would be to see them as two separate policies um, as, as separate but equal to coin a phrase. But um, I'm not suggesting necessarily that these two things be, be combined together. Thank you for the clarification. So um, I think we've given you enough to work with here. I see um, heads nodding. So um, any other new business under item six? Seeing none, it's a very short meeting today. We are adjourned. <laughs>